uh, introduce the next speaker, which is Professor Vlad Shalaev from Purdue. And uh, he's, a, in fact, uh, he's also scientific director for the Burke Nanotechnology Center. Uh, for those of you who might not know, particularly the younger people, he's one of the real pioneers of metamaterial. He published early on, you know, the metamaterial started at uh, microwave frequency, but the challenge was to make a metamaterial in a negative refractive index at optical wavelength. And he succeeded. The effect then was so people did not believe in it. In fact, uh, uh, he had good. A hard time at the beginning putting in a so-called high profile journal. Eventually he got it into optics letter and the citation shooted up to many, many thousand. So we talked about it several times, also happened to me several times, you know. Uh, the fact that they give you a hard time at the beginning on something is actually should be an encouragement to do a real great work and to push hard and indeed, indeed, but he did much more. He has done a lot on plasmonics, particularly with uh, Boltaseva working on very interesting plasmonic material that are die dielectric. And that has opened up a new field of plasmonics, metasurfaces. Last but not least, he has won several prestigious prizes. I want to note in particular the Maxwell Bone Prize of the Optical Society. And together with, uh, with Bob Boyd, as I mentioned before, the 2020 Frank Isaacson Prize of the American Physical Society. So welcome, Vlad, and we are excited to hear your uh, uh, talk. Thank you, Federica, for your uh, kind introduction. Um, well, uh, I wish I was in beautiful Warsaw, but hopefully next time. Anyway, so uh, in this talk, I will discuss how photonics uh, will be playing a significant role in the uh, ongoing uh, uh, quantum technology revolution. And specifically, I would emphasize how it would benefit from two fields. One is plasmonic slash metamaterials, which is in the focus of this conference. Another one is AI, which is yet another technology evolution. So uh, here is outline of what I'm gonna cover today, but basically I have two main messages. One, uh, by using the unique confinement of electromagnetic modes, which plasmonics enables down to few nanometers only, we could dramatically speed up quantum processes to the extent that they outpace uh, decoherence. And that could potentially solve the biggest problem of quantum. Yet another uh, important thing uh, I'd like to cover today, uh, since in quantum, we essentially dealing with very small signals we need to speed up processing of information. And particularly if you're talking about integrated quantum photonic system with thousands of elements, I believe there is no any other way as doing it with uh, uh, machine learning involved. So those are two messages. So the uh, demand to process information uh, faster is undeniable. And this uh, one of many plots which illustrate that, which illustrate that in this particular plot, uh, I show how calculations per second per hundred dollars evolve with time, starting from a uh, simple analytical engine and moving to nano days, uh, non electronic based uh, computers. And I most believe that the next speed up could be accomplished through using photonics and quantum approaches. And we all know electronics is fantastic. Uh, what has been accomplished is spectacular, but you're actually hitting the wall. You cannot process information with electronics faster than 10 and maybe 100 gigahertz because of the fundamental RC delays and some energy considerations. Whereas with photonics, you're actually limited by the carrying frequency only, which is uh, four orders of magnitude higher. And nowadays computers actually already include a number of uh, photonic elements to ensure the speed, to enable the speed. And that includes photo detectors, modulates, and of course, lots of optical waveguides. But all these optical elements are silicon based and they basically diffraction limited. And with silicon, it means that the size of optical elements is uh, two, 300 nanometers, but not smaller than that. And the only feasible way to confine light further is actually to use plasmonics. Like this uh, small metallic particles where electrons are free bounce up and down. 
the confinement of electromagnetic load in this case would be defined by the size of the particle. It could be, let's say, 10, 20 nanometers. Even stronger confinement could be accomplished with so-called gap plasmas, when you actually have two metallic structures and a dielectric gap in between. And that gap could be exceptionally small, few nanometers. It could be even few atomic layers only. And in this case, electromagnetic modes would be confined to that uh, drastically small sizes. And that's actually a very unique opportunity for quantum, as I will show uh, further. Before I proceed, uh, let me mention briefly uh, the field actually, which is uh, which served as a precursor for metamaterials in many regards. It's related to random composite materials and both Bob Boyd and myself actually had, had been working in this area quite for a while. Specifically, I'm showing here so-called fractal aggregates uh, which are scale invariant where, uh, and uh, structures actually repeat the structure of the whole on a progressively smaller scale, either deterministically, like in the case of this forum, or statistically, like in the case of this aggregate, seal aggregate of nanoparticles. And because of the fractal morphology, as we showed in our early uh, papers, they actually promote localization of uh, collective plasma excitations. Uh, in fact, it could be mapped to Anderson problem, but in this case, of course, we are talking about optical excitations, resulting in uh, areas of very high local fields, which we refer to as uh, hotspots, that enable dramatic enhancement of nonlinear responses. And of course, uh, that eventually resulted in engineered uh, nanostructures with uh, desired optical properties. And I'm showing here only a few. Uh, such as uh, uh, metal lens, uh, uh, metal hologram. And, but in, in principle, it could do lots of different things, including these um, time variant metasurfaces, which could enable, for example, non-reciprocal light propagation. And I would say the most spectacular applications related to metamaterials are going in the area of flat optics, uh, which are enabled by metasurfaces. And that's, of course, the area where our chairman actually did pioneering uh, similar contribution. So let's move to quantum. Uh, when it comes down to material platform, which uh, would be most suitable to accomplish all the goals we're pursuing with uh, uh, quantum, there is clearly a trade-off between interaction strengths where uh, superconducting qubits seem, uh, seem to uh, enable better control and coherence time, where affordance actually provide better protection. And there are all other material platforms in between, including color centers and solids, strapped ions, uh, Chris Monroe, uh, arrays of Rayburg Adam, Michel Lukin, and uh, many, many other uh, uh, possible approaches. So, but one thing is for sure that photonics will play indeed essential role in quantum. Uh, with photons, we uh, package information into signal of zero mass and propagate it the ultimate speed. So clearly there are many uh, applications in the realm of quantum for photonics, including of course sensing, uh, quantum simulations and potentially quantum computing and indeed quantum communication. And that's all related to simple fact that photons are robust. They don't interact with each other, they don't have charges, and their interaction with matter is uh, weak. But this is a double-edged sword because to generate photons, to control them, we actually do need, uh, when it's need, I mean, in special cases, a strong coupling to matter. How to control it, that's actually the challenge. And if you look at the, one of the perhaps most spectacular experiments related to quantum communication by this Chinese group using the satellite quantum communication, the speed with which actually this information was passed was really slow. It's only the range of uh, uh, kilohertz, which of course for photonics is not spectacular at all. And that's exactly because of light matter coupling is small. Okay, so how we could speed up light matter, how we could speed up processes and increase light matter coupling. Uh, I will show several examples. One is related to plasmonic modulator, work we did with uh, uh, your Chloidholt in ETH, and also how you could actually uh, produce single photons. It's much higher rate by using plasmonics. And I also will emphasize that machine learning will be playing indeed a very essential role in all these uh, applications we are talking about. Let's start with this plasmonic modulator. This is actually a very simple idea. So uh, you would like to put it all on the chip. You send information through a silicon waveguide. Uh, in, in this case, of course, losses are not high. 
and you couple it to a plasmonic ring chrysanate as is shown in this picture. And inside of this ring, you play uh, optoelectronic material, uh, uh, organic material, which changes its refractive index when you we apply some voltage. So when you apply the voltage, you could actually make it so that the light propagating through silicon waveguide does couple to the ring resonator. In this case, it's actually trapped in this ring resonator, ring resonator and it doesn't pass through. Or you change the voltage and it doesn't couple to ring resonator, then it simply passes through. So it turns out that this simple uh, approach actually enables really uh, high uh, modul efficient modulation with 10 dB extinction ratio, and most importantly, at high speed, terahertz speeds. That's actually where plasmonics could really make a big difference, the rates of these speeds. Okay, and uh, let's come to this uh, major challenge, light meta coupling. We know actually how to increase light meta coupling is just to place your uh, quantum unit, let's say two level atom, inside of a cavity. Then phonons actually uh, bouncing up and back between uh, uh, travels up and back and between two mirrors and effectively couples more efficiently because it goes many times for this uh, quantum system. And the enhancement goes uh, uh, as the ratio of quality factor of the KT and the volume where electromagnetic mode is confined. The problem with this approach, of course, you do increase light matter coupling and quality factor for dielectric cavities, such as, for example, a defect in photonic crystal could be as high as uh, 10 million or even above. But the volume is limited, it's diffraction limited. It cannot be smaller than the wavelengths. There is yet another problem. Uh, the higher the quality factor, the slower the response. And that's the key thing I'd like to address. We need high speeds. So you pay the price when you use this approach to increase light matter coupling because high Q means uh, slow responses. So plasmonics makes a difference in that regard. Q is not as high, it's just 100, meaning that basically it provides broad, broad bandwidths in the range of terahertz, very fast speed, but volume could be much smaller. Instead of let's say 500 nanometers, it could be five nanometers only. 100 times smaller, you raise it to the power of three, it's a million uh, uh, times gain. So basically you could have the same amount increase in light matter coupling, but you do not sacrifice the speed. Your system would iterate at terahertz speeds, potentially outpacing the decoherence rate. And that's where plasmodics comes into the game in terms of quantum applications. So conventional approach, to deal with decoherence is actually to go to extremely low temperatures, uh, low pressures, trap atoms, trap ions. And of course it does increase the coherence time. And uh, in principle, it could, uh, it, it the way to be the decoherence, but it, it takes uh, extreme measures. So what instead of going this way, what actually we are trying to uh, uh, speed up the process, quantum process, such as for example, a single photon emitter uh, emission. So if the emission occurs faster than decoherence happens, then actually uh, it's immune to decoherence because it's simply outpaced the decoherence rate. And that's how exactly plasmonics could work. So uh, I will show uh, this idea, illustrate this idea by using this uh, plasmonic nano patch antennas, uh, uh, which uh, dramatically speed up this emission of single photons. So in this case, we would place your quantum emitter, such as nitrogen vacancy nanodiamond, in the gap between uh, silver uh, epitaxial film and single crystal silver cube. The smaller the gap, the better in this case, because the confinement is stronger, the cell enhancement is better, uh, stronger. But the antenna shouldn't be too small because you would like to outcouple photons at very high rate, at the rate which beats the decoherence rate and losses rates. Basically, you would like to outcouple your phonons before plasmons decay. So it would be immune not only to decoherence, but also to losses in the system. So the antenna should be on the scale of let's say 60, 70 nanometers, where the gap, the smaller, the better. So, uh, and here you see our first results, which kind of uh, simple-minded. In this case, we just would throw out nano diamonds on the silver film. And then uh, we throw out on top of that silver cubes. And just by chance, in some cases, silver cube ends up sitting at the top of this nano diamond. And what we obtained that uh, 100 times increase in uh, emission rate, in uh, 100, or in other words, 100 times uh, decrease in spontaneous uh, in the lifetime. So, and also we saw 100 times increase in the brightness. So it clearly occurs because of this uh, plasmonic enhancement, but this is far from being uh, optimized. 
to, uh, but even in this case, if you take into account the, uh, uh, all the transmittance uh, in our system, uh, all the uh, efficiency of collections, uh, we actually produce photons at the rate of half a, uh, million, half a billion photons per second, which is quite impressive. So how to further improve it? Uh, we, need, we need to use this deterministic assembly of nanopitch antennas for single photon sources. So what we do, you uh, place this nanodiamond with nitrogen vacancy on top of glass substrate first, you characterize them, you find the one which is really good. Then you pick it up with the tip of a, uh, AFM and put it on the epitaxial silver. Then with the same tip of AFM, you push a silver cube at top of nanodiamond so that you end up with nanodiamond sitting exactly at the edge of this nano cube, where as calculations show the enhancement is particularly strong. And what we obtained in this case, it's uh, by far more spectacular. The life shortening is actually 3,500, which uh, results in record fast decay rate for a single and the center, which is only 23 picosecond. And of course, we check that this is single photon source by doing this standard G2 measurement. So as our calculations show, uh, actually in this case, it's the efficiency is quite amazing, 96%, because basically you yeah, outcouple photons faster than any decay in the system. For that, you need ideally the cavity as small as three nanometers, the size of this cube is 60 nanometers. Then the efficiency could be 96%, and the rate with which photons uh, would be emitted is 300 terahertz. This theory, in our case, we are not there yet. Uh, but we already have this 23 picosecond rate of emission, which is uh, quite, quite, quite impressive. And certainly we could further improve it, potentially beating the rate of uh, decoherence. Typical decoherence is in the range of one picosecond. So we need just only slightly further increase the rate of emission of photons, then it would happen faster than decoherence, which would result in a source of indistinguishable photons, which is in the heart of all quantum applications, including this uh, quantum computing based on uh, boson sampling, uh, based on photons. It's all based on uh, sources of indistinguishable photons, which requires emitting photons faster than decoherence. Okay, let me move on and show that machine learning, yet, yet another thing which could make a big difference for quantum applications. So when I was talking about the single foreign sources, we would like actually to use as small nano diamonds as possible because in this case, gap is smaller, per cell enhancement is stronger. And we use specifically 25 nanometer nano diamonds, but in this case, only one out of thousand nano diamonds actually host an NV center. And uh, you could imagine how long time it takes actually to find out a good source. And to uh, do this G2 correlation measurement, it also takes several minutes, sometimes up to one hour to get this uh, beautiful deep and then uh, use the, uh, the field. So clearly there is demand for fast, precise method that can identify good emitters, meaning single photon emitters, uh, with, very, with much sparse data, which you could collect within one second only. So, and uh, that's the typical uh, experiment we are doing normally. So you would do this uh, correlation uh, uh, measurements. Uh, so with two arms and you uh, measure G2 as a function of delay between the two uh, pulses propagating through two different arms. So, and when you do it for several minutes, you get this nice uh, deep, and then you use this Levenberg markward fitting and take it at uh, the time delay zero. And if it's below 0.5, you say this is single photon emittance. Actually, the smaller it is, the better. If it's above, it's not single photon emittance. But if you take your uh, data only within one second, that's how a spectrum looks like. No way to say whether it's single photon source or not. So how to, uh, how to deal with this? Is there any way still to get this information within a very short period of time? And the idea is actually simple. That's exactly where machine learning works so efficiently. You first pre-characterize uh, certain uh, emitters. Basically, you know whether they're single or not single photon emitters by doing the standard measurements. And then you uh, train your classifier based on one second time collection sparse data by using these uh, pre-characterized uh, pre emitters. So, and when you train your neural network uh, emitter, uh, uh, say, uh, network, then you could do characterization very fast within, within this uh, one second collection time. And here you could see uh, if you do this one second collection time with, con with conventional method, the accuracy prediction is 50%, 53. It's basically a random guess. Of course, it's either single photon or not single photon emitter. In other words, the method simply doesn't work with such short collection time. 
However, if you do this neural network uh, training, uh, then actually the accuracy is 92%. Within very short collection time, you could, with high fidelity, say whether it's a single photon source or not. And you could see, see all the other metrics, they're very spectacular, about 90% uh, for this very short, very uh, 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 short collection time. So we basically show it nearly 200 times speed up in identifying whether your emitter is a single photon or not by using machine learning approach. Okay, let me use yet another very interesting uh, idea related to super resolution, uh, which could, uh, super resolution imaging, which could be enabled by this machine learning. Let me remind you that uh, when it comes down to this resolution limit, uh, lambda over 2n, uh, it's based on some fundamental assumption. Uh, linear optics, stationary sample, homogeneous illumination and classical fields, using classical fields. If you break any of these assumptions, then you could actually beat the resolution limit. And some of Nobel Prizes actually were given for doing exactly that. For example, if you use nonlinear approach and specifically so-called stimulated emission depletion stat, then you could, of course, uh, accomplish the super resolution. Yet another approach to use non-stationary non sample that enables so-called stochastic optical reconstruction, microscopy storm. You could also use inhomogeneous source, uh, and that enables so-called structured illumination microscopy scene. So what if you replace classical fields with quantum? Can we get uh, some benefits in terms of super resolution by doing, uh, by doing this approach? Okay, and to explain the idea, let me show this Gedanken experiment suggested by Stefan Hall. So let's assume that we have a source which produce two photons only. Every time it emits, it always emits two photons by pairs. Then let's say if you have 50-50 beam split, as it's shown here, and two independent uh, cameras. So what you obtain in this case, two independent Gaussian spots with the same point spread function. And simple multiplication, multiplication of point spread function leads to square root of gain in resolution. Of course, in real quantum experiment emitter, uh, you have this anti-bunched uh, photons. So what we measure in this case is actually the absence of two photon correlation. But uh, since we are dealing with the same amount of information due to sub postsonian statistics of photon emission, we still could get the same increase in resolution by square root of two by doing this type of experiment. And here the experiment, the standard experiment, how people would do it. So you basically do uh, photoluminescence map and along with this G2 map. Basically, you take this ultra correlation map as a function of a special position at a zero delay between the pulses. Here you could see photoluminescence map that enhanced photoluminescence map, and this is G2 map. And correlating the two, you have this increase in resolution by square root of two. Of course, if you go to higher correlation function, the higher correlation measurements, you would get a uh, uh, increase in resolution by square root of two, square root of four, and so on. So the uh, uh, pros of this are obvious. You are, uh, I mean, you get this super resolution. It also could be used in combination with uh, other super resolution technique, but the cons are also obvious. Measuring G2 and particularly higher correlation functions, it's enormously time consuming task, which makes it impossible, particularly if you move to really higher correlation function. And that's exactly where machine learning makes a huge difference, as we already know. You could do this G2 mapping, basically taking a single photon source, such as nitrogen vacancy, nano diamond, and uh, doing this special map at the zero delay between two pulses. Uh, in a very fast mission, if you train your neural network. And that's exactly what we did. Here you could see the results. This is photoluminescence map from a single nanodiamond within this center. This is G2 map, which we obtained by using convolution neural network. And this is result image, uh, which provide this super resolution increase by square root of two. And this mapping took us only 1.4 hours, which is 70, uh, as opposed to 17 hours, which you would need to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to use uh, to take this standard direct fitting. So we have speed up by factor of 12 in this case. So uh, uh, here you can see the experimental results. So this is uh, original photoluminescence mapping. And this is result image, which shows this square root of two decrease in the spot which uh, you detect. So to uh, sum up this part, so the clearly the strong machine learning impact. What we already showed that machine learning assisted alta correlation uh, measurements eat the classification accuracy over 92% with 100 times uh, speed up. 
Moreover, it enables really fast uh, 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 G2 measurements uh, on the scale of few seconds, which is simply impossible with direct fitting. On top of that, I demonstrated that uh, this machine learning enables fast uh, super resolution imaging via anti punching uh, experiments. Okay, let's move on and uh, say a few words about toward integrated quantum devices. When it comes down to real uh, big challenges in the field of quantum, we need to deal with more complex uh, material platform. And that's exactly what we are pursuing in the recently funded uh, by DOE Quantum Science Center. So basically uh, the approach we are taking is based on hybrid systems. It involves spin qubits, which uh, could be initiated with microwave photons. And these qubits could couple uh, with each other via magnets uh, because they are placed on uh, uh, magnetic materials that uh, support magnet excitations, uh, collective magnet excitations. And the qubits could be initiated also and read out with optical photons. So this system actually is hybrid and it involves uh, spins, it involves collective spin uh, propagation magnets and photons for optical readout. And the coupling between spin via magnets could be controlled electrically by applying simply the voltage. Let me explain the idea. So that's exactly how we do it. We take coffee film, which supports magnets. We place nitrogen vacancy uh, nanodiamonds within these centers, which uh, support these uh, 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 local spin defects. So when you apply the voltage and all this coffee film also, also sit on this, uh, on this piezo, uh, on this, elect uh, on this ferroelectric substrate. So when you apply the voltage, what happens, uh, because you change the electrical polarization, it induces distress in your magnetic materials. And because of this stress, the direction and the magnitude of magnetic anisotropy changes. As a result, the whole magnet band moves. So that if initially the magnet band was overlapping with the resonance of spin defect, uh, then when you apply the voltage, it moves away and it doesn't overlap anymore with a uh, spin defect, which means actually you switched on and off the coupling between uh, spin resonance and uh, magnets. And that could be de 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 uh, detected optically by using this optical relaxometry. So what we observe when you apply the voltage, the uh, rate of uh, relaxation increased dramatically because in this case, spin do couple to magnets. And when uh, you switch off the voltage, uh, then uh, uh, spin do not interact with magnets and relaxation rate decreases dramatically. So you could have switch on and off this coupling between spins via magnets, which is a very attractive approach. So before I proceed, let me say a few words about the importance of uh, introducing platforms which are compatible with the existing industry, which are most compatible. In this case, we are very, we were very happy recently to obtain uh, very efficient single photon sources in silicon nitride, which is a material of choice for nanophotonics. And, uh, and we, for this, we actually had to prepare silicon nitride in a slightly different fashion. Specifically, we fabricated, we use this high density plasma CVD approach and obtain non-stichiometric silicon nitride with, which are kind of enriched in terms of nitrogen. So the result was actually quite amazing. We dramatically suppressed the fluorescence background and we obtained really bright single photon emitters uh, uh, in the range of 100,000 counts per second, which are stable, linearly polarized and have high purity. The G2 was uh, routinely always below 0.2 and in many cases 0.1 or even less. So I, I think it's very important that the room temperature, we have now single photon cell source in this uh, in the, uh, the very important technologically important silicon nitride platforms. So let's uh, move. Uh, Vlad, there's a couple of minutes left. Just okay. maybe speed it up a bit. Yeah, that's what I need. So uh, what, since you could uh, change with the leg by applying a uh, voltage, you could change the uh, magnets and their coupling to spins. You could use it as to sense electrical fields. And for that, uh, you basically, what you do, you want to nano pattern actually your magnets so that the magnet resonance would be very sharp. In this case, uh, the sensitivity to change in the electric field would be much higher. And what we showed that in this case, you could actually have record high sensitivity for DC electrical fields by using these magnets. So this uh, hybrid platform uh, can be used for record high sensitivity in detecting electrical fields. So let me just sum up two big messages to let's say what I think are important messages. Plasmonics could speed up dramatically quantum processes 
and uh, make them immune to decoherence. I gave an example of the single photon sources, but it also could be applicable to single photon detectors, to quantum converters, and to deterministic gates using single photon nonlinearities. By speeding up the process, you basically outpace the coherence. That's one message, and plasmonics in that sense could play a very important role. Since in quantum we're dealing with these very small signals, and uh, when you want to integrate complex uh, quantum photonic system, you really uh, would benefit a lot by using machine learning. And uh, we demonstrated that and others for uh, metrology, for quantum device optimization, as well as for uh, uh, this imaging with super resolution. So uh, with this, let me end up and show this outline, which would remind the topics which we cover. Thank you all for your attention, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Vlad, for a very exciting talk. In fact, I'm going to read uh, uh, a question here, which uh, actually is identical to what I wanted to ask you. So it's uh, by Gilad Haran. By coupling to, to the plasma, aren't you inheriting the decoherence time of the plasmon it, uh, itself. In other words, to what extent will you be able to get indistinguishable, indistinguishable photons in uh, this way? It's a very good question, and it could happen that way, but fortunately, it doesn't. So basically, when you use this uh, uh, light matter uh, uh, increase in coupling, one could say maybe the coherence also increases. According to our experiment, uh, it does not happen. In decoherence, in our case, it largely happens due to electron phonon coupling. And uh, so what we do see in our experiments when we uh, put this quantum emitter in plasmonic nanoantennas, we see uh, the increase in the rate of spontaneous emission, let's say 100 times, and the same uh, increase in the brightness. Basically, it means that all this goes to more photons emitting per second, rather than going into some uh, non-radiative channel. And that would indicate that you actually increase some, uh, perhaps potentially decrease okay. of the non-radiative channel. Good. Uh, there is a, another question, and these are two questions by the same individual, Sam Lin. You use the CN, CNNs, uh, convolutional NNs, to classify sparse 2G2 plots. I thought CNNs are used for image data. Isn't the, the, the sparse G2 data one-dimensional, 1D? That's a very technical question, and I'm just reading it off here. Well, I, I, instead of going into these details, let me just uh, take it broader, this question. First of all, we use many different uh, existing machine learning techniques, not only CNN. We use uh, many others, so I, I, I don't want to police them. It's like five, six different others. And sometimes CNN works best, sometimes some others work best for classifying. But I would say there is a more general problem here. All these machine learning approaches have been developed for other type of problems, such as imaging, voice recognition, image recognition. What there is a huge demand now in is to develop a machine learning algorithm which would be suited for these particular problems. We call it physics-informed, physics-driven algorithm. And that's what we are working now hard on. But in principle, that's, you're right, the, the bigger the data set, uh, the uh, more efficient work, that's all well-known things. I, I just want to draw well, your attention to this problem. OK. Folks, I don't see any more questions. So again, let's thank uh, Vlad again for a very exciting talks. In fact, both of the speaker, Bob and also Vlad, thank you both. Goodbye. Thank you, folks. Victor. <laughs>